Hello and welcome to the Rural Doctors program. I'm Jerry Gannon. In this program, we're going to look at personality disorders. We'll talk to North Metropolitan Mental Health about dialectical behavioral therapy, and we'll also catch up with the RACGP about their education programs for GPs who are interested in mental health. But first up, let's join Dr. Olga Ward and Dr. Nick De Felice, a psychiatrist from West Perth, in a discussion on the diagnosis, management, and treatment of mental health. Nick, welcome back to the Rural Doctors Program. Thank you very much, Olga. Nick, could you tell us a little bit about there's some new mood stabilisers and antidepressants on the market and some drugs that I think most GPs are less familiar with, things like valdoxin and raboxetine. Where do they fit in? Hmm. Yeah, uh, no trouble, Olga. There's, there, there are a lot of developments in the area of uh, uh, antidepressant medication and also uh, with mood stabilisers, maybe not so much uh, new drugs, but uh, uh, medications that are now used in ways that we haven't used them before. So with, with regard to the mood stabilisers first, of course, uh, the traditional ones we've used are lithium and valproate, mm -hmm. um, uh, carbamazepine as well occasionally is used, but perhaps not so much these days. Yeah. But uh, uh, I guess the, the new medication that we're using in that regard is lamotrigine, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, like so all, another epilepsy drug. Another epilepsy drug. So, so there was a theory in the 80s that bipolar disorder uh, might be some form of uh, epileptiform activity, some ki a kindling phenomenon. And so that's what led to the use of carbamazepine and valproate in the first place. And ever since then, psychiatrists have jumped on the bandwagon of all mm -hmm. the new uh, anticonvulsants that have come along. They've all been tried in, in bipolar disorder, in mania in particular, uh, most of them have uh, uh, have uh, ingloriously uh, come to an end uh, yeah. in that regard. But lamotrigine has got an interesting story. So it wasn't thought to be all that, or wasn't found to be all that helpful in, in the manic phases of bipolar disorder, which is where these drugs are initially tested. But then when they looked at the evidence in depressive phases of bipolar disorder, they found that there was actually a signal that there was some benefit for lamotrigine. Uh, and uh, in actual fact, there's been a few uh, studies, and, and on the on the balance of those, the meta-analysis shows that actually lamotrigine does have an effect in bipolar depression. Is this something that would be used by a general practitioner for a, yeah. a bipolar patient? Well, I mean, it depends on the interest of the GP in treating bipolar disorder and their confidence with it. But but certainly, it is a drug that, in terms of side effects, it's quite uh, quite good. Yeah. Uh, it does have, of course, a really significant side effect, which is that you can get a very serious rash, uh, an allergic rash, which has actually it's like uh, a Stevens been Johnson fatal. Type thing. It's, it mm -hmm. has actually been fatal. So, therefore, the requirement is to go slowly with the titration. And uh, there are different regimes, but the, the regime I use is to start with either 12.5 or 25 milligrams and increase by 25 milligrams every two weeks. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time, of course, to get to the sort of doses that you need, but that's a, a regime that's used. And, and these days, not only is it uh, used in bipolar depression, but I've, I've noticed that it's being used more even in depression, a, a unipolar depression, without any bipolarity being present. Now, that's actually a use that hasn't got any research evidence behind it, but Anecdotally, people are finding that uh, some psychiatrists are finding that there's some benefit from it. So, yeah. you know, in those desperate cases, it's one of the old drugs that might have a different use or a new use now. The other drug that's, uh, again, not new but a different use is uh, the use of quetiapine mm -hmm. in bipolar disorder. And so, we all know that quetiapine uh, has uh, anti manic effects. Yeah. And now there's actually really very good data about uh, antidepressant effects of quetiapine in bipolar disorder and bipolar depression. So we see that well, maybe there are maybe we should consider this drug as a mood stabiliser. Yeah. And, and some people are advocating the use of quetiapine in, in people with bipolar disorder, particularly bipolar one disorder, where. Um, any conference you go to with the international experts talking about bipolar disorder, there'll always be, you know, one group of internationally acclaimed experts who think that you should never use antidepressants, and there'll be an equally acclaimed 
group who think that antidepressants have a role in bipolar yeah. disorder. So there is division, divided opinion in psychiatry, and, and maybe that's why the mood stabilisers are, are actually sort of finding a little bit a stronger place in the treatment so of bipolar depression anyway. Bipolar 1 and 2? Yeah, what when do it they comes mean? to... Yeah, so bipolar 1 is where people have manic episodes as part of their bipolar disorder. Bipolar 2 is where they have hypomania. Mm -hmm. And look, there's a great deal of controversy about how bipolar, how high you need to be to, to get to manic or to, bi, to hypomanic uh, uh, phases. Uh, stages, yeah, and I stages. guess if you get the treatment in quickly, you're going to keep them as a 2 anyway, aren't you? Well, again, there's a... Uh, you know, one of the odd things about our, our diagnostic system is that... Um, if you have hypomania or hypomanic symptoms, they're exactly the same as the manic symptoms, but if you get hospitalised, for example, you suddenly become a manic patient. So I can transform hypomania into mania simply by admission. So you understand that it's mm -hmm. a very grey zone in terms of these differences, but people with bipolar disorder, bipolar 2, uh, are often people who get more troubled by the depressed phase rather than the manic phases and they'll be the ones where you know you'll ask them the, the story and they'll tell you about uh, uh, some hypomanic episodes mostly and you know it's sometimes difficult to discern that they've got a bipolar mm -hmm. disorder but it's gen generally hypomania at the mild end that they'll have. Yeah. Would you use something like quetiapine as an adjunctive in patient who was just simply depressed with no manic phases at all? Yes, the, I mean it certainly can be used. Again, this is not uh, you know, based on, the, on research but uh, uh, there is some evidence for its role in depression uh, and there's actually even evidence for its role in anxiety disorders. Uh, so y you can use it and you know in the old days uh, maybe a psychiatrist like myself, uh, some, of the, some of the older people out there might might know that they used melaral, so thyridazine yeah. was commonly used in depression to try to reduce the level of agitation and it can sometimes be really useful in reducing the level of agitation enough uh, the patient then can seem to be able to cope better and, and their depression seems to be a bit better. So quetiapine it, it has the same sort of role, maybe it also has some antidepressant properties itself, so it definitely has a role. What about some of these other drugs? Valdoxin I'm not very familiar yeah, so, with. Yeah, so moving on to antidepressants, newer uh, antidepressant agents. Uh, agamelatine, valdoxin, is the, uh, probably the newest one that's, uh, that's around. Mm. This is thought to be... Is that a, a part of a group? Obviously we've got no, like SSRIs no. and there's SNRIs yeah. and then what, this so, is so something new again. Yes, this, that's right. And that's the exciting thing about agamelatine is that it's actually in a, in a different class. It's thought mm -hmm. to work on the melatonin receptor yep. and it works on, the, uh, on a serotonin receptor, the, 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 uh, uh, one of the, the serotonin receptors. And so the, I, I, don't, I don't think actually anyone really knows precisely the mechanism of action except that it's got these, uh, these actions. Uh, the, there's a thought that it regulates or it, it sort of normalises circadian rhythms by its effect on melatonin. It's not sedating, let's say, like a benzo or quetiapine might be, but it's more, um, it seems that people with agamelatine get a better quality of sleep, so they sleep better with the drug, they mm -hmm. feel more refreshed in the morning, and maybe that's got to do with circadian rhythms. So um, if it lives up in clinical practice to the, to the clinical trials, it's certainly a drug that's uh, appropriate to use first line because in terms of side effects, it's, it's really quite benign. Yeah. Uh, fan, you know, the, the wonderful thing about it is it, it doesn't have sexual dysfunction as a major side effect. It doesn't have weight gain as a, as a prominent side effect. It doesn't have sedation generally as a, as a side effect. So side effect profile is really good and mm -hmm. it's certainly a drug that in, uh, prior, in general practice could be used. Um, but again, I think we're yet to, to find out where it actually fits in the therapeutic armamentarium. You know, uh, it's not on the PBS, so there's an expense mm -hmm. uh, to the drug, and the usual dose of 25 milligram at night, I think, costs people about $60 a month. So, uh, 50 milligrams might cost them $120 a month. That might be beyond the reach of uh, a lot of people, particularly if uh, 
uh, the new budget measures come in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I think that uh, certainly in the hands of a specialist, in my usage is it's usually combined with other drugs. And in that regard, it's, it's, I've been combining it with a number of different agents without any problem in terms of uh, mm -hmm. You know, s interactions or problem at all. And do you uh, need to reduce the dose of the, of the no, first antidepressant before adding the second no, one? No, no, Olga. I think that it's, it can be fairly safely added. Again, I think that uh, as, a f as a general principle, it's a good idea to use one agent mm. uh, rather than two. Uh, and there's certainly no research evidence for combinations, that, yeah. especially with agamelatine. Uh, but it yeah. could certainly be a, a decent drug to trial in the first instance. Yeah. If you were trying to switch somebody over, mm. say from, I don't know, market leading SSRI or SNRI, yeah. Yeah. would you, do you, do you give them a, a washout period in which they get nothing or do you yeah. sort of add this and uh, tail the other one off? I, I wouldn't, I'd just add it and tail the other one off in the usual manner that you would tail the other one off. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I would do it. And how quickly would you expect a response? Again, it's the same as with all antidepressants, you know, two to four weeks to start to have a response. It takes two or three months to have its full effect. Yeah. So, so that's the sort of time frames you'd be looking yeah. at. And what about riboxetine, which is yeah. the other thing one of my patients has just come back on and I thought, oh, what's that? What's that? Yeah, so riboxetine has actually been around for quite a bit longer than agamelatine. Riboxetine is a, um, a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. So mm -hmm. we've got the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This oh. is a selective noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Uh, and l like all the antidepressants, uh, Olga, it's had to have clinical trials showing not only its superiority to placebo, mm -hmm. but also its equivalence to other antidepressant classes. Yep. And, and there is that evidence for it. Um, so the, if you the, had a patient on an SSRI, why would you add that instead of just putting them on an SNRI? Well, I wouldn't necessarily wouldn't. add that just instead. I, I, would, I would actually so sort of consider using an SNRI. But the advantage of, um, of riboxetine is that because it's got a noradrenergic effect, it's said to be somewhat more activating. Mm -hmm. And some of the SSRIs, people, uh, some people actually get quite sedated with serotonin. And so for some people, having a noradrenergic effect might increase energy, might activate them somewhat, and that could be of benefit. Of course, the downside is that it's much more likely to be anxiety-provoking, mm. make, make you agitated, cause uh, sleeplessness. So, so there are downsides, but nevertheless, it has a role, it has a place. Mm -hmm. Another drug that's not new, but is uh, perhaps uh, likely to be used, and we should consider using a little bit more, is bupropion. Of course, this is Zyban, the drug used oh, in the... cigarette mm -hmm. uh, addiction. Uh, I and thought when they trialled it initially as, a, as an antidepressant, it wasn't much chop. Well, I don't think it's got the most powerful uh, antidepressant effect in terms of reputation or whatever, but it's actually the uh, most common add-on antidepressant in the US. So it's very commonly added on to other agents. And uh, the benefit of it is that it's thought to be dopaminergic in its effect. And so when you've tried drugs from other classes, it's certainly something to think about uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as an alternative. Again, side effect wise, it doesn't cause sexual dysfunction. It's not likely to cause weight gain. So it's worth thinking about uh, bupropion, 150 milligram in the morning or 300 milligram in the morning. The cost, uh, in my own practice, the cost was prohibitive at first, but I've had patients who've recently been able to access it for you know, about the same sort of price as the agamelatine, $50 a month or something like that, again, depending on the dose. So I think it, it brings it, at least for some people, in the realm of, well, a possible alternative to think about, you know? Special groups, Nick. Yes. And there are special groups. Adolescents and the elderly, I guess, come yeah. to mind. As yeah. you, is uh, any warnings about using any particular medications for adolescents? Is there anything that's much less suitable for them, or much more suitable? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think I'll go. I'm not the best person because I don't know all of the details in adolescents. I don't treat adolescents uh, uh, mm -hmm. at all. Uh, but I understand that there that uh, Paroxetine is thought to be 
uh, problematic in adolescence. Uh, but I think all of the antidepressants have got a question mark on them. And the reason they have that is because, first of all, the evidence for their effectiveness in, anti in, in adolescent uh, populations isn't all that good. In fact, you know, even with the tricyclic antidepressants, you know, quite a, quite a, a, a potent uh, antidepressant class, the evidence for their effectiveness in adolescents, ab above and beyond the effect of placebo, is not all that great. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have an effect. It's just that in terms of the evidence that, that, that we have available, we, we just don't have that clinical trial evidence for it. Well, that's my understanding, anyway, of the, mm. of the, of the information. So I, I don't think anyone could uh, comfortably say, yeah, look, there's a role for... Uh, for uh, this antidepressant or that antidepressant, and and I think that the really important thing when you if you're treating adolescents with antidepressants, is to get them back and see them soon after you start the medication because mm -hmm. they seem to be a little bit more susceptible to having suicidal ideas in the context of initiation of uh, of, uh, of of antidepressants. Uh, maybe mm. you, you recall that uh, uh, the Scientologists made a big fuss of. Uh, Prozac mm. uh, and its reputed association with you know, the emergence of suicidal ideation. Yep. Uh, I think that the evidence is that this is if it's an, if it's a phenomenon that occurs, it's a, it's an, a very very uncommon phenomenon. It might well be that some people do have that that that, that experience, mm. but in adolescence, it seems that that might be a little bit more likely. So I think if if you're prescribing antidepressants in adolescent populations. See them a week later. Tell, give them a phone number to contact, so that hey, if you've got the, if you've got any ideas, if you get worse, please call me in the meantime. You know, and, yeah. and try to get that rapport going with them and that, that sort of safety net for them. You know. What about the other end of the spectrum? The elderly. The elderly. Yeah. Okay. Who are for for country GPs? Of course, we've got yeah a whole usually a whole nursing home or hostel or care units. Yeah. Full of elderly people taking medications for everything. Yes, they are. Um, and they're lonely and becoming disabled and becoming isolated. Yeah. Where do you start with elderly people? First of all, you start with assessment mm. and, and a proper assessment. And um, uh, it's very easy in the elderly to dismiss their mood symptoms as symptomatic of their circumstances and I mean that's the first thing I think you have to be aware of. Mm. Uh, the second thing I think to be aware of is suicidality in older people. You know the suicide yeah. rate increases in, in, in the elderly um, and, and it's important to ask about suicide so I mean they're things that certainly you can do in general practice you know. Mm. I guess the other the other sort of tricky bit about uh, about or well, the thing to be on the on the lookout in the elderly is that they can present with what I call quasi psychotic symptoms. So they get preoccupied by various things, and then that becomes such a sort of focus that you, they seem you, you can't actually convince them otherwise. So the typical thing is they'll be troubled by their bowels. I was going they? to say it'll be their bowels. <laughs> Constipation, and you know. No, nothing you'll do will ever fix this up. You know, doctor, my bowels are terrible. And, and I, don't mean the, I don't sort of mean the person who's been complaining of this for the last 20 years. Mm. I mean, you know, the elderly person who's they fixate got on it, down and they become very, very, very fixated on that, you know. Um, and, and then in that sort of context, you know, quite commonly, the, they'll be sure that there's something wrong, that they've got some mm. terrible illness. I usually say, yes, you do. It's a depressive illness. It's a terrible illness to have. Yeah. But but they get some. They get fixed. They get the idea that they've got, um, you know, usually some sort of cancer. somatic, yeah, yeah, illness. Or or they 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 get the idea that uh, they're financially ruined or that they can't afford things. So it wouldn't be uncommon uh, for you know for elderly patients with psychotic symptoms to come into the Perth clinic. I've got to. Uh, say, I saw this patient this morning, didn't I? Well, I've got a, I've got a fellow in there today, you know, at the moment who, who is sure that he's got no money. I mean, he's very well off. Mm. He's you know he's he's got ample sufficiency for the next uh, few years. He's ninety, so but but he's absolutely 
convinced and can't be convinced otherwise that he can't afford to be in hospital even though he's got private health cover and he pays six dollars for his prescriptions etc so i guess just to be aware of that sort of preoccupation which is an irrational preoccupation which you mm. can't seem to shift and the family will tell you you know we've told her a hundred times that you know it's no trouble we, we can afford it or whatever but she just can't be convinced they may have a psychotic depression so yeah. that's the point of that that observation mm -hmm. is just to identify that because so once you've seen that patient yeah and i'm sure every general practitioner is going aha uh, i've yes, seen I've that, that patient person, i've yeah. got that patient yeah in terms of, uh, of medication yeah. and trying to, to sneak something in almost under their radar because yeah. they're quite resistant to taking yeah. anything for it, how do you kind of approach that sort of patient and, and say to them, look, I think this will help you? I mean, do you say, let's, let's have this nice tablet for your bowels or have, can, can you actually be sufficiently upfront about it to say, yeah. I know that this is, and what would you use? Well, first of all, we're all different in our approach and in mm. the... In, the, in our capacity to sort of form a therapeutic alliance and this is where GPs have it over, over specialists you know, a million fold because you've usually been treating them for the last 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years or more. So you've got that rapport that's built and you should use that rapport and you should use the knowledge you have about that patient to see if you can get around that objection that you have, you know. Uh, yep. Yes, I mean, my approach is to sort of say, look, yeah, you, you do have an illness. This is a, a serious illness, but I think actually it can respond to treatment. And, you know, I, th I reckon that we should give it a go and I, I'll try to engage them. But of course, that doesn't mean it works for everyone. For some people, of course, you'll say, look, even if it does nothing else, it'll help you to sleep. So let's yep. give you something to try to help you to sleep and maybe the, maybe that you can get around it that way. Or mm -hmm. some of these patients will say that their appetite's gone off. So, you know, you might be able to... Certainly the thing that Speak antidepressants all do is, <laughs> is they cause, uh, you know, appetite stimulation. So, so they're the sort of circumstances, they're the sort of ways that you might use. But you've got to use your knowledge of the patient and, and sometimes family can help you mm -hmm. to sort of negotiate with the with the, with the patient. Um, so in terms of what to yeah. use, uh, in the event that the person's got that sort of, uh, as I said, a quasi-psychotic or a psychotic type of depression, I usually find that we that you need to, to use a, an antipsychotic along with it. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, depending on the, the symptoms that they have, a lanzapine, 2.5 milligrams, 5 milligrams, that sort of dosage, mm -hmm. sometimes more depending on how profoundly unwell they are. Uh, Lanzapine is usually well tolerated. It stimulates, uh, uh, you know, it stimulates their appetite, etc. You've got to be careful. You don't want to sedate them too much. There are other problems in terms of, you know, it ha has anticholinergic effects. So, so there are things you've got to be watching mm. for. And, and of course, certainly in the elderly with, uh, with dementia, the use of the atypicals is associated with a slightly increased risk of stroke yeah. and a slightly increased mortality, you know. But, but these are things you weigh up against how much the person is suffering. Um, and if they, if they don't have a psychotic element to their presentation, well, like, you don't need to use an antipsychotic. Yeah. And then I'd use just whatever the antidepressant is that you're familiar with using. So I could tell you, look, use citalopram because it's got less effect in terms of cytochrome P450s and all of those sort of things. Use agamelatine, use metazapine. But what I think is you should use the drug that you're comfortable with using, that you know how to use in, in all your patients. Mm -hmm. you, you know, there are two or three that you'll be sort of familiar with. Use them um, in the elderly, start low, go slowly up, but it doesn't mean to stop low yeah you know and i think that that's sometimes the mistake we make as well we, we under treat serious depression uh and you know they're just not going to get better if you give them 10 milligrams of escitalopram you know you, you you will need to push at least to 20 milligrams you know yeah what about the patients who have very limited communication? You know, where you've got a gut feeling that they're probably pretty depressed, but yeah. they've had a stroke as well and they're a bit, a bit locked in or they yeah. can't express themselves Yeah, that's a really good question. And maybe even Parkinson's disease mm. where, you know... The, they always the, look so they flat. They look so flat, don't they? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I think that in that sort of circumstance, we have to recognise that these brain disorders are associated with an increased risk of depression. Mm. And, you know, generally, uh, you know, my opinion is that you're probably going to, you, you've got a low likelihood of making things worse. Yeah. You've certainly got a big likelihood of missing and not treating. So I think that, it, you know, a trial of an antidepressant in that circumstance may not be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing I think we should do in the elderly, in, in any circumstance, whether we recognise the depression clearly or we just think that they might have one, is, okay, a trial of an antidepressant, but that's a trial. Yeah. What it means is an adequate dose for an adequate period. Maybe in the elderly, instead of two to four weeks, we should think maybe six weeks. Yeah. And then, if, and, and a good dose, and if it doesn't work, you can keep them on forever, but it's not going to make any difference. So you should actually reconsider after, say, six months, uh, sorry, after six weeks or a couple of months. Mm -hmm. If they're not getting better, if there's no progress, change to something different. Yeah. And in those people where you think, oh, look, this is uh, a little bit unclear, maybe you might try a trial of a couple of different agents, so an SSRI, an SNRI, if you're a bit more convinced, you might try a tricyclic. If you're a bit less so, you'll think, OK, well, look, we've given it a go. Let's stop the medicine so we don't have them on it for, just because we like the idea of being on an antidepressant. Yeah. And then see whether, see what happens from there if the person gets worse or not. Mm -hmm. The treatment of personality disorder has been notoriously difficult, but there are some therapies that increasingly have a strong evidence base. We spoke with Elizabeth Webb from North Metropolitan Mental Health about one of those therapies, dialectical behavioural therapy. DBT stands for dialectical behaviour therapy. It's a form of cognitive behaviour therapy um, with a bit of a twist. It was developed by uh, Dr. Marsha Linehan, who's a clinical psychologist. She developed it in the US uh, sort of in the 1980s and onwards uh, for uh, treatment of women with problems with emotional regulation. And these women typically have histories of uh, self-harm, deliberate self-harm, uh, suicide attempts and the like. And they usually uh, are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Uh, but the, the real issue she was directing, or the problem she was directing it at, was emotional dysregulation. Um, it's a modular therapy. So she developed a comprehensive model that includes individual therapy, group therapy, um, a supervision consultation uh, process for therapists who are involved in treating these clients, and uh, telephone contact for coaching and skills. Uh, DBT understanding a borderline personality disorder is that these are women who come with uh, a biological vulnerability so they are more sort of sensitive to emotional stimuli uh, than typically um, they respond more strongly um, to emotional cues and it takes them longer to sort of get back down to a, to a baseline you know, sort of to baseline, which for them anyway is more emotionally aroused than most of us. Um, and then they've had the experience of uh, an invalidating environment in which they've not learnt how to manage that vulnerability that they have. Uh, because of their life experiences, there's all sorts of life skills they've just not acquired. Um, so DBT uh, is, as I said, it's a, mo it's a staged therapy. So the initial therapy, the initial 12 months of it, is looking at teaching the sorts of, skill sorts of skills that this group need to be able to manage their behaviour in more functional ways. Um, and so the, the group itself teaches those skills. Um, the individual therapist's function is to sort of support the activities of, from the group and look at the application of those skills uh, in real life situations. So normally it is in managing um, self-harming or impulsivity uh, or other impulsive behaviours. Um, so, sometimes it's sort of suicidal thinking, that sort of chronic um, uh, suicidality um, or other things, you know, the sort of 
angry outbursts and the like that are often a, a part of the, the presentation with this group. So that's what the individual therapist is doing uh, in session. Now the, the telephone coaching is also a very important component. Um, it's recognised that what we want to happen is for these skills to be generalised to sort of real settings. And I often say to my, my patients, you can think about this like a, having a football coach. You know, you might go to training, I don't know what you do, once a week, twice a week, if you're a young person, you know, you go to training and you run through, well, this is what you have to do when the match is on Sunday, this is, the, this is our strategy, this is what we're going to do. So the match comes on Sunday and your coach doesn't turn up. You know, you would feel a bit let down. So this is what your individual therapist is doing. She's running through with you in session. This is how you need the skills. Then when you're at the game, she's on the phone saying, this is what we practice, this is what we talked about, this is what you need to do. You're just sounding like you're getting really quiet, sort of uh, distressed now. I just want you to just take a moment. Yeah, just take a moment. Okay, so just... Just take a couple of mindful breaths there, just... The fourth component is the peer supervision and uh, consultation based on the assumption that people treating borderline clients really need support. Uh, and also they need help to stay true to the model. So the, the purpose of the meeting in a way is like DBT for the therapist. It's keeping them adherent to the model and helping them when they get stuck to do DBT and keeping an eye on burnout and all those sorts of things. So providing that sort of uh, collegiate and supportive environment in which they can um, uh, manage clients who are often in crisis. The first step is learning skills to manage your behaviour. So learning other ways to manage distress other than self-harm. The first is mindfulness. The second is, um, or another is interpersonal skills, so being more interpersonally effective. The other is skills in managing emotions, so emotion regulation skills. And the final are distress tolerance skills. Mindfulness is seen as a core skill, a core set of skills. Uh, to just, it is about just being aware of oneself and what is happening around one and being able to uh, manage, you know, sort of focus of your attention. And to, and to observe your life and, and yourself in ways that are sort of non-judgmental and be able to put some words to what you are actually seeing. By and large, our clients are very avoidant. They sort of don't want to know about themselves and they miss a lot of what's happening in their life. Uh, the second lot of skills are really about how to interact with others and get your own needs met in ways that are thoughtful of the relationship, the sort of relationship you have with that other person and of your own self-respect. Um, emotion regulation skills from our point of view are really about understanding your emotions, or the function of them, where they come from, being able to put words to them, having an emotional vocabulary, being able to uh, increase the amount of positive emotional experience you have in your life, decrease your vulnerability to distressing emotions, um, and to let go of emotional suffering. This is really very difficult material for most of our patients. And the, the final group of skills that we taught or teach rather are around distress tolerance. Um, it's a recognition that uh, sometimes there's nothing you can do about a problem. That maybe there's nothing you can do about it in that moment, or maybe there's nothing you can do about it ever. Um, so being able to manage the distress that you feel when you can't solve that a problem. So crisis, sort of getting through a crisis without making things worse. So you've, tried, you've tried some of those distress tolerance skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I need you to do now, yeah, yeah, what I need you to do now is go back and use some of those. Now I want you to do this for about... There's an, a very unfortunate view widespread view that once you know once labeled with borderline personality disorder that's it for life you will never change there's also a view which i think is is uh reducing less less commonly found that you know to use a phrase these people are bad not mad and really shouldn't be in the system and we have nothing we can offer them the last can often be true in that it can be hard to offer them what they need. 
But there have been a, a, a couple of long, of ongoing longitudinal studies that have looked at what happens with this group over time. Uh, and they, have, they are encouraging outcomes. You know, these people do in fact get well, and they particularly get well if they have access to evidence-based treatments. Um, such as DBT, but as I said, there, there are others. It's not the only one that has um, support here. Um, and we do see that with our own, uh, through our own program. We see people get well. I think the encouraging view about this too is that, them, that if you contrast borderline personality disorder with, say, major depressive disorder, that it looks like... Uh, the former it takes longer for people to sort of uh, go into remission, but they stay. But once that happens, they stay well longer. Whereas depression may have more a quick recovery and then a, a more frequent relapse. I think that the latest sort of feeling about this is that you can get symptom relief fairly quickly, for uh, initially with those with borderline personality disorder, but then you need, or well, they need, ongoing. Uh, input around some of those sort of um, psychosocial needs that they have to really get their lives happening. You know, it's not just about controlling the, the or them learning to control those behaviours or behave in more functional, skillful ways. Access to this treatment or other evidence-based treatments is a, um, a major problem for these clients and for service providers getting, getting access for their clients to, or their patients to this sort of treatment is difficult. Um, I don't really have an answer to how to deal with that access problem. I, I face it all the time because I have to deal with a huge wait list for this. So I, I talk to women who've been referred and say to them, well, yes, you would benefit from this. Unfortunately, there's a 12 to 18 month wait before you can start treatment. Um, now, no one likes to see anyone remain in, in real pain and suffering any moment longer than they need, and they don't want to stay there either. So to feel that there's something here for you but you've got a long wait for it, it you know, can, for some, can be very distressing. I think if you're working with these clients, if you take a, a sort of DBT frame to it, um, or an understanding of the problem, even if you're not providing the therapy per se, you could still be extremely helpful and uh, encouraging and validating of your of your clients. I think the other thing that to, to be able to say to people is don't give up because people actually can be, this is a treatable condition. The primary treatment though is not medication. The primary treatment is, is a psychotherapy but it is treatable and people do get well. And there's lots of ways in which that happens. DBT might be, DBT is only one but obviously you know sitting in my seat I've got to say it's the gold standard. But there, are, but there are obviously others that also, um, as I've said a few times, are evidence-based treatments that also produce outcomes. So don't despair, I guess, is my, my message. And, and help, your, help your patients not despair, that there are, there are ways to, to move past where they're at. All right, so you do that. Go do that. And when you settle, uh, you give me a call back. And our thanks to Elizabeth Webb for her time and to the staff at North Metropolitan Mental Health for being involved in the interview and the simulated consultation. Now let's return to our main discussion with Dr Olga Ward. Now one of the other things that general practitioners come across is patients having what to, to the GP seems like a normal grief reaction. You know, yeah. Their partner has died suddenly of a brain tumour or in a fit or a car accident yeah. or something and they come in and go... I think I need some antidepressants. Can you talk us through how you would, would deal with that with one of your patients? Yeah, I remember when I was a registrar, um, my, my, one of my consultants sat me down Olga, and said, today we're gonna talk about the difference between grief and depression. And I walked out of that, uh, that, that uh, supervision session thinking, I don't really know I can always tell the difference and I don't think they can either. Mm. When it's at the extremes, Olga, it's, it's easy to understand and easy to see the difference. So a normal grief reaction, 
the person's sad and down about the, the loss of their loved one, uh, they, they, uh, they lose interest in some things, but they still can enjoy some activities, they can still find meaning and the, the, the pleasure that they used to enjoy. You know, if the Dockers win, they still get a bit of a, a buzz, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, they, they don't feel bad about themselves. Sure, their sleep might be a bit disturbed, but they've still got some energy. Mm. So, so, so they're a bit off their tucker, and they. You know what I mean? They're, yeah, yeah, but, 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 and, but at the other end, you know, they might have a gr Someone might have a grief, but they'll they'll not just be depressed and sad all the time, but um, you know, they'll think themselves to be bad. They'll be full of regret. Uh, they'll be troubled by guilt. They'll, they'll, they just can't enjoy anything. They'll feel themselves to be worthless or, or hopeless. Um, so they're the things that might point toward, you know, and then their sleep is, is often the typical pattern. So they wake early, uh, they feel worse in the morning and maybe better as the day goes on. So those melancholic features. Well, when you've got those extremes, I think you can tell that a large group of people are going to be in the middle. Yeah. Uh, and I think that... In dealing with the one end, the depressed end, you should treat them, you know, because as you would any yeah. other antidepressants. And for the other end, uh, you know, I don't think there's any point in treating with antidepressants. You've got to be supportive, you know, and again, the relationships that GPs have with their patients over years can help them to be in a really strong position to, to be supportive of the, the person. You know, sometimes you have to invite the person to be supported. So look, yep. come back and see me again in a couple of weeks. Let's talk about how you're going or in a, in a month or so. You know, you've got to mm -hmm. be a bit proactive sometimes yep. because people will sometimes feel a little bit embarrassed to, to have to have that sort of help, you know, particularly yeah. blokes you know, in, yep. the, in the country, you know. So, I think sometimes it's, it's almost um, needed mm. for the GP to say, look, this is normal grief. Yeah, sure. You know, we would expect you to feel like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then for that big group in the middle, Olga, sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. In fact, our diagnostic system recognises that. The DSM basically sort of says, look, here are all the symptoms of depression, but if, you, if, it's, if it's grief and if it's bereavement, you shouldn't diagnose depression for the first six months. Mm. So they just have a a time criterion to make the yeah. distinction and, and of course that's an inadequate criterion but that's a long that's what they sort of say you know so so I think that in that group again sure support you know try to get give the person an opportunity to talk but also think about the role of antidepressants because because depression can make grief very difficult to overcome and if I've got a predisposition to depression, the time when it's going to become evident is precisely when I have a significant loss like that. Mm. You know? So it's important to, to, to try to help mm. in that way. You know? I'm also thinking about, in terms of grief, the patients who come back with a serious disability. And of course, we see that people who have farm accidents or traffic accidents or whatever, yeah. they'll come back into the community. And of course, they're lifelong grieving the loss of their their leg or their independence or yeah. their their ability to you know grip a farm implement yeah, absolutely when you've got a, a a precipitating factor that then remains in place like for example not even something let's say the loss of a, a function of the leg or something but let's say chronic pain or something like that when when the the thing that brought the depression on remains in place it's it's a constant irritant that provokes the presence of depression. So there's a ceiling to how much benefit antidepressants are going to provide. Yeah. You should use them, but don't be surprised that they only help to a degree. You mm. know, and, and I think that GPs really underestimate the the role that they have in terms of helping people adjust to to, to that sort of grief, yeah. and and the role that they can play in supporting them. And you know almost like, uh, I sort of call it perspective therapy, helping the person to see a bigger picture. You know, what we all do as human beings is we put ourselves on that continuum of suffering, don't we? We, we sort of like, yeah, oh yeah, well look, I'm here, but, you know, 
I wish I could walk, you know, I've lost two legs, but I wish I could walk, but you know, at least I'm better than the guy behind me who's got no leg, no arms either, you know what I mean? Somehow there's a, a consolation we have yeah. in having that broader perspective of what, mm -hmm. what life's about, you know, and, and having those sort of discussions with patients and dealing, you know, facing that can be helpful for them. Yeah. At least it gives them a chance to talk about yeah. what they're feeling, you know. And we at least can see the patient on numerous occasions exactly. without a huge amount of cost. But we do have a significant time limitation in yeah. a busy general practice. Yeah. 15 minutes? Yeah, look. What can, what can I do for, for my patient in 15 minutes? So, Olga, I, you know, I used to do hospice work as a, as a GP, uh, and then I did uh, hospice work as a psychiatrist. So it was a different way of working. I was sort yep. of, I was the psychiatrist coming in to see people, let's say, in the, in the palliative care ward or whatever. And I can tell you now, I did better psychotherapy as a hospice doctor than I did as a psychiatrist. <laughs> and the reason that is, is because I was touching the patient, I treated their nausea, I treated their pain, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they, there was a trust that grew in that, the, the relationship grew just through 10 minute appointments, 15 minute appointments, briefs at a times. And you know, after a while the person you know, would often, when they trust you, they have the, they sort of have the courage, you know, you have the courage to ask, look, how are you going with this, you know, uh, like in that circumstance, you know, gee, is it frightening for you or what's, you know, how do you yep. feel about, you know, you just introduce the topic and then that gives them the courage and the opportunity to talk about it, you know. That sort of psychotherapy, don't underestimate it, it's very, very powerful and then it builds a bond so that you build on it the next time. You don't have to have one hour psychotherapy sessions with patients. As a GP, you can still do really good work just with 10, 15 minutes just of sharing philosophies, sharing perspectives, helping the person get it in, 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 a, in a perspective that helps them cope, you know? Mm. The one thing I think that our society lacks are morning rituals. Uh, to, to, for, to give people a sense of how to engage the process mm. of grief. You know, there are now some cultures... Now that we cultures, don't wear black for a year and that's violet right. for so, a year I mean, and a veil for Coming from an long, Italian yeah. background, it was such an easy thing. You knew exactly what to do because you were supposed to wear black for this length of time and you couldn't watch TV. And, you know, when you went to visit someone who was grieving, you bring the coffee and it was all ritualised. Mm. And, and, of course... Of course, there's nothing healing about the ritual, but at least it gives people a sense of knowing how to behave in that mm. period and gives them a way of, a way of remembering the yeah. person who's died. You know, so I think... My, I think it involves quite... A, you know, it involves the whole community it, it involves then. Others. So everybody is yeah. travelling the same journey, yeah, whereas true. now I think people feel that they grieve alone. Yeah, I think that that's very true. So what I tell my patients in that circumstance is to establish their own rituals. So, you know, if that mm -hmm. means, you know, at a month or, you know, you know, you know, at the anniversaries certainly and at birthdays and at Christmas and things, you know, you put a flower there or you light a candle or you say a mass or you, you know, you go to your, your local church or you go to your synagogue or, or, or uh, you know, wh wherever you go to, something that's meaningful that you do that remembers the person because the reality is you can't not remember so you may as well remember it in the way of, you know, respectfully remembering and, uh, and then give that the time so that you can then move on with the rest of life, you know. Yeah. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that, but I think establishing rituals in the, in the grieving process is, is a really important thing which, as I said, our society lacks and which maybe we can help people, people with, you know. Mm. One of the other extremely confronting things yeah. for GPs um, in the country, because there's so so few mental health teams, is that somebody who's had a really major traumatic event. Yeah. Like I said, you know, that might be losing your right arm, yeah. or it might be some young woman who's been raped, yes, or somebody who's been uh, beaten up and injured, yeah, and. Or even somebody who's had a dreadfully stressful event at work. Yeah. And they come in and they say, I've got post-traumatic stress. Yeah. The first thing is to, to understand that the diagnostic criteria for PTSD requires a certain type of trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
if someone at work is offensive to me, it doesn't actually fit the criterion. I mean, in, 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 in establishing that criterion, Olga, what psychiatrists have tried to do is to say, look, we don't want to make this term a meaningless term. It's a term that we use in terms, in, 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 as a, as a, uh, to sort of, to understand the response to more severe trauma, the trauma at, the, at that more severe mm. end of the scale, you know, a loss of a, an arm, um, you know, a, a significant event like rape or those sort of traumatic incidents, you know, mm -hmm. um, car accident, uh, you know, a farming accident, all those sort of things. So there's that, that's the first thing. Yeah. And then of course there are the classic symptoms that people have of the, the nightmares of the event. Now it's quite common to have nightmares for two, three, four weeks, a month, maybe a couple of months, but generally they'll dissipate. Yep. But in PTSD, they hang around. So then, two years later, it's still yeah. replaying. Yeah, That's... maybe not as frequently at night in, the, mm -hmm. in your dreams. And then it replays during the day. Yeah. And you have those flashbacks and those other re-experiencing, the, the, the intrusiveness of it. And, and when you have a reminder, you know, you're anxious, you've got all the, the peripheral stigmata of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And then there's avoidance that goes with that experience. So you avoid things that are associated with that traumatic event that remind mm -hmm. you of it. And then there's also that numbing that goes with that avoidance. So the, the numbing of the interaction that people have with others, the sort of capacity to feel, there's that numbing of your feelings. And, and then there's more general symptoms like, uh, you know, hyper arousal. You know, a lot of people with PTSD yeah, like the jumpy will be Vietnam jumpy. vets and they'll yeah, hear they'll a jumpy. twig snap and they'll yeah. just yeah. about either hit the ground or turn around and sock someone. Yeah, so, so there's that jumpiness, that mm. exaggerated startle. You know, people who have car accidents, they'll be vigilant all the time on the roads. You know, if I'm held up in a bank, sure, I know when I walk into a bank, it's possible that I'll have, uh, be the victim of a hold up. But I tell you what, if I've been in a hold-up, the next time I'm thinking to go in a bank, it's not a possibility, it's a probability. Yeah. So there's, there's that change that happens in your mm -hmm. cognition. So the treatments are aimed at trying to change the, the person's you know, sort of way of thinking about that mm -hmm. trauma. Now, for a, for a country patient, um, yeah. that's going to mean yeah. brief sessions with the GP. Yeah possibly telehealth access to the psychiatrist? Possibly. Possibly a different psychologist every three months or two months. <laughs> possibly. Given, given the, the state of our mental health teams. Yeah. Um, what's the, the best constant and do you medicate this? Yeah, yeah. I wish I could tell you that uh, there was a PTSD medication. Really, I mean, the treatment for PTSD it, the, the pharmacological treatment for PTSD is really all about reducing the level of agitation and anxiety and treating comorbid depression if it mm. arises. So we're really. back to we're, we're, antidepressants with some kind of anxiolytic. Yeah, or, or you know, antipsychotics with, uh, you know, with sedative properties. I mean, that's mm -hmm. really what we're doing. In fact, that's Not what, ideal, but all not we've ideal. got. In fact, that's what people do when they're drinking a lot. They're mm -hmm. trying to treat the, the, with alcohol the, the vividness of their memories, you know, which of course then just adds to their problems. I wish I could tell you that there were better treatments. I think even if you've got lots of good alternatives, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like even in the city where you might have psychologists, you know, PTSD very commonly does have some residual symptoms, maybe yeah. not, not necessarily impinging on one's function, but certainly, you know, it's not an uncommon thing to end up with some residual PTSD mm -hmm. symptoms. And Nick, online resources for any of these for yeah. any of these topics? Anything that the GPs can access themselves or point point the patients to? Probably the the only website that I really encourage people to go to with regard to CBT in particular is uh, Mood Gym. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, it's uh, by the, uh, ANU, the Australian National University. Uh, if you Google Mood Gym, you generally get to it, and that's an online CBT program. Um, the Black Dog Institute, Beyond Blue, th th yeah. those places are really good places where you get good leads to other sorts of uh, online activities. Sounds good. Any final hot practical tips, Nick? Um, uh, don't underestimate the relationship that you as a GP develop with your patient. It's really important and uh, you know you should use that relationship for, for, for good.
<laughs> Not for evil, of course. <laughs> Nick, thanks very much for joining us yeah, today. Pleasure, Olga. Pleasure. Well, finally, for this program, we spoke with Beth McEwen from the RACGP about the mental health training opportunities that are available for GPs. Many GPs are involved with completing and reviewing treatment plans for their patients, or they might be involved in delivering focused psychological strategies to their patients. So these GPs, they're always on the lookout for mental health education and training. So there's a general practice mental health standards collaboration, the GPMHSC, and they have endorsed two levels of training for GPs. So the first level is mental health skills training, so often referred to as level one training, and the second level is the focused psychological skills training or FPS skills training, also sometimes called level two training. The objectives of the mental health skills training or the level one it's for developing the skills in assessing mental health problems in general practice, in treatment planning, and also reviewing commonly presented mental health problems in general practice. Um, GPs who do this training, once they've completed it, they're able to access Medicare item numbers relating to the treatment plans, specifically Medicare item numbers 2715 and 2717. So the training that they do for their mental health skills training, it's got to be interactive, it's got to be pretty hands-on training, there has to be predisposing, there has to be reinforcing material, and it also needs to have the input of a consumer and a carer perspective. It can be face-to-face -face or it can be an online module that they complete for their mental health skills training. Uh, those GPs who are quite often seeing mental health illnesses in their practice such as depression and anxiety. So it makes sense for them to complete the mental health skills training so that they can use those relevant Medicare item numbers. And at the moment, there's no requirement for GPs to do any ongoing mental health CPD to maintain their level one status. However, the GPMHSC would definitely recommend that GPs are always actively seeking out education and training just to maintain and extend those mental health skills. So the focus psychological strategies or the FPS skills training, sometimes called the level two training, this is about developing GP skills in the provision of evidence-based medicine, FPS, such as cognitive behaviour therapies. So that's the CBT workshops. And these FPS skills training courses, once again, they have to be very interactive, have to have the predisposing and the reinforcing ele elements. But these activities have got to be at least 20 hours in duration. And GPs completing these courses, they can then become registered with Medicare as a provider of FPS. And that then means that they can go on to access the Medicare item numbers 2721 and 2727. So there is a requirement. GPs who have got this level two training, they have to do ongoing CPD in FPS in each subsequent triennium so as to maintain their status with Medicare. So GPs completing the mental health skills training are then equipped to complete the treatment plans and refer their patients on to other allied health professionals. But GPs completing the level two training, they are then probably well placed within their own practice to deliver some of those extended counselling skills. The General Practice Mental Health Standards Collaboration, they've developed a handbook for GPs and this outlines all the requirements of the mental health education and training and it also focuses on the skills that are necessary for a GP to be able to deliver those um, mental health services within their general practice. And the handbook's available on the RSCGP website. Um, GPs can follow through to the GPMHSC section and they can download the handbook from there. It will also give them advice if they want to put in an individual application with the GPMHSC. Most of the education that they're going to be doing for mental health is going to be through accredited education providers, but they do have the facility to self-apply for mental health points, especially for the ongoing um, mental health and FPS CPD activities. 
So the RACGP WA faculty, we're very excited to be offering the FPS skills training to rural GPs and we are running a three day CBT workshop. So we've got our next one taking place in Broome on the 13th to 15th of June and then a second one taking place in Karatha on the 18th to 20th of July. So a prerequisite for this course is that GPs should first complete their mental health skills training and if they haven't done so already there's a fair few online options that they can complete to get this done beforehand. They can access the registration form from the RACGP website. Once, ago, once again, going along to the GPMHSC section, they can go to find a mental health course. So they'll find details of the upcoming CBT workshops, but they'll also find details of other activities to meet their mental health requirements for the triennium, including online options that they can complete. Mental health is one of the core components of the RACGP education. It's definitely included within the curriculum. So more and more GPs are finding it necessary to do mental health training so as to better service their patients presenting with mental illness. More education in mental health is going to be better for your practice, it's going to be better for your patients. So any questions that you might have about the requirements, you know, by all means get in touch with us at the WA faculty or download the guide which is available on the GPMHSC website. Well, that's it for this program, and thanks once again to all our guests for their time and their expertise. If you'd like to review this program or any of the others, you can visit our website at ruralhealthwest.com.au and watch shows going back to 2010. We'll be back on the 1st of July with a program looking at demystifying neurology. We look forward to your company then. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>